Good morning, church. Hallelujah. You braved the, the snow to come here this morning, and I thank you for that. We're going to have a great message, I believe, this morning. Uh, God's put it on my heart, and, and this is one of those things. We're talking about family matters, as Allison's already mentioned. And as we jump in this morning, just a couple of things that we're going to look at. Last week, we were talking about the men. So, men, I, I made most of you mad. I can see a lot of you didn't show up this morning. You got to deal with that. That's what the Bible says. It's not necessarily what Curtis says. Just remember that. And women, you remember that as well as we speak about y'all today. As I was thinking about the sermon today, uh, now women, this isn't because of you. I was thinking about a good horse. And let me just just say this is for both men and women. I was teaching the other night out at uh, the Texas Tech Veterinary uh, Medicine uh, School of Medicine there, and, and we were just having a great time. And afterwards, um, some of the young adults came forward and were talking to me, and, and one of the, the uh, young women there said, you know, um, um, did you ever have one of those good cow horses? And I said, well, um, they were probably good. I just probably wasn't a good cowboy. You know, I, I had a few of them. I, I know what a dock bar is. I know what a peppy sand badger is. I know the lineage, the line that makes a good cutting horse. I, I used to watch it. Alice and I, for five years, went to the World Horse Show. I mean, we loved going and seeing these great horses. And, and what was interesting about that, she said, well, I've, I've had a few good ones. You know, I don't know if I've ever had, had anything just real, real solid. And as we're going back and forth, I said, well, you know, you can put some cow on a horse. And she looked at me kind of funny, like, no, you can't. Like that's either bred in them or it's not. It's either there or it isn't. And, and, and there's some truth in, in both because you can really take a horse and you can put him on cattle and you can show him what a gate is and you can really work with this horse. And some horses are more stubborn than others. I had a horse one time by the name of Dolly Annie. I traded for her and uh, from a welding job. And I was going to give her to Allison for Christmas. She was five years old, never had a saddle on her. And that was quite an exper experiment and experience because she really didn't have the line, the lineage. And finally, after a year of working with this horse, my buddy Steve Friskup, he said, Curtis, I'm going to tell you something. You would not believe how much further you would be down the road if you would have just got a good horse. And, and I was roping calves off of her, had taken her all the way through um, every program I knew, had watched programs, had just done everything I could with this horse. But still, if I pulled up, Anywhere with this horse on the trailer, you would think I had a line on the trailer because this thing was rocking the trailer, pawing, pawing the trailer, making all kinds of racket, was trying to find a way out of the trailer. Uh, other cowboys didn't like to tie. I didn't tie her next to any other horse because she'd just take them down. She'd start kicking them, biting them. It didn't matter. She bit my welder um, right in the fat of his back one day for no reason, just standing in the pen, just reached over and latched a hold. It matters what's in the DNA. And what happens with each one of us as we learn about family matters and we learn about our personalities and sometimes we wonder, why do I think the way I think? Why do I do the very things that I do? Sometimes we pick up what the Apostle Paul calls the old man, what's familiar to us. Some of you grew up around a dad or a mom who had a temperament, a hot temperament. And so what happens, sometimes that's passed along in the lineage. And when we come to Christ, we're born again. We have a chance. We have hope that we'll live according to the Spirit, not according to the flesh. So when I bring these points out to you this morning, I want you to hear me and hear me clearly that the more we can identify these traits that come from Adamic sin, the more we can begin to ask God to overcome those traits that are not bringing glory to our Heavenly Father, Jesus Christ. Would you please stand for the reading of the Scripture this morning? It comes to us from Genesis chapter 3, starting with verse 6. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized they were naked. So they, they, they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. You may be seated. There's a, a Latin term known as imago Dei, which simply means this. It means God's image within us, and it is celebrating God's image within us. We want to see God's image, and we want to be a reflection of who God is within us simply because of this. It's who we're called to be as brothers and sisters in Christ. One image is not greater than the other image. I would say it this way. One gender is not greater than the other gender. We both have gender roles and responsibilities 
for the family of God and within our personal families and even as we leave our families to our work families. Last week, as I said, we, we emphasized the man. Today, we'll emphasize the woman. The more we understand who made us, how we were made, the responsibility of both sexes, the more we will build families and the kingdom of God will be expressed through them. Now, if you're not married or divorced or too young to care, listen, maybe one of the first two primarily, I would simply say the world is broken. It is. It's out of order. And we're going to find more about this, find out more about this today. Some of you have come from broken families, broken dreams. You've come from homes of chaos. That's to change. That's supposed to change as we come to Christ. Life is not level for any of us. However, I want us to see our differences within the two genders, male and female. And this should give us grace for ourselves and grace for one another. One of the things I said last week is we're either um, pulling heaven down or bringing hell up into our relationships. So we need to take, pay attention to what I'm speaking on today. The issue, the issue isn't whether you like it. The issue is whether or not you want God in it. And so we're going to look at some of these things. The problem, here's the problem. Our God is a God of order. Now, he created humanity in the garden, and we see this or outside the garden and brought humanity into the garden, and disorder. Disorder happened in the garden, which we spoke about last week. But ever since then, we can see the problem with sin and humanity. We are always tempted to get things out of order. In our culture, you look at our culture. Our culture, why not live together before we're married? Why not have sex before we're married? Every song, just 99% of the songs out there promote things like that. Let's go and sow our wild oats, and one day we'll settle down. Will wild oats grow too? You know, many of us choose college prior to a profession. I don't know about that. You know, it's, it's one of those things that, yeah, we're to grow up, but grow up in what? We're to grow up in the Lord. So women, it was not good for man to be alone, and God made you. He made you a helper who was suitable for the man. But when Adam didn't lead, you took the reins and you did. At the tree in Genesis chapter 3 verse 6, when the woman saw the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was desirable to make one wise, she took from its fruit and ate and she gave also to her husband with her and he ate. Now last week I emphasized that that man was first. He came first. But you'll see the first one to the tree was the woman. Where was Adam? Well, he was close enough to listen to Eve. And I want any young man that comes around my daughters to put them first. But we do this through God's design, not a design of our own. A man should lead his wife, should be a protector of all women, should be a noble gentleman. Men, when we step away, it's just commonplace for the women to step forward, to step up. It's innate within them. You could almost say it's in their DNA to do those things. And what we see here is order going to disorder. When the Apostle Paul was writing his letter to Timothy, he stated it this way, 1 Timothy 2.13, it was Adam who was first created and then Eve. And it was not Adam who was deceived, but the woman being deceived fell into transgression. Now, as we look at this, this can, can bring up some anxiety in some of us. Adam was first and then Eve and then we see what happens here. But I want you to know that when God looks at the genders, both of them have roles and responsibility for and responsibilities for his purpose. There is something known as gender equality in scripture, if you will. Now I have to be careful with that because the politicians have redefined that term. But today, we're going to look at it kind of through a different lens. I, I think back to when Allison, I'm supposed to share this story, when we were on our first um, anniversary trip. We went back to where we were. We had our honeymoon, and, and I told her uh, we were going to spend about three days there. We were going to Angel Fire, New Mexico, and we were going to fish um, Eagle Nest Lake. And, and so I told her, I said, I've got to run by and get the boat. And she said, I didn't even know we had a boat. I said, oh, yeah, we've got a boat, and a friend of mine, 
um, Kurt Deputy and I had gone in and bought a boat while we both worked at the VA hospital right after we got out of the military, and, and uh, we bought this little boat. And so I went by, got this boat, took it to the lake, and uh, we're on Eagle Nest or, or putting it on Eagle Nest Lake, and when I push it out into the water, um, my dog and Allison are on that boat. Now, uh, I didn't say anything to Allison about how to drive the boat because my goal was to be the captain of the ship. That's what I thought my purpose was. So I said, when you get out there a little ways, just throw the rope to me and I'll pull you back in, but let me run my pickup up to the top real quick and I'll run back down here and then you just pitch the rope. There wasn't any wind. Everything was fine. So, so I did. I ran up there and I, and I hear Allison yelling and I come running down. Um, to, to, to the edge of the water, and she's like, you didn't put the plug in the boat, it's filling up, and I could see the back end just doing that, and it was a little bitty boat, and I was like, well, it's right up there in front, just fish through the water and try to find it, and you can put it in from the inside, you know, just, just get it in there, and she's fishing around, and no kidding, my German Shepherd, who's on the boat with her, just jumps off the boat and starts swimming to shore. She's like, I'm done. I, I'm not messing with this. I've been around him enough to know this isn't a good idea. So she throws that rope, finally gets it over to me. I run out in the water, and I'm pulling her in and everything, and we're trying to figure out what we're going to do from there. My whole point is simply this. Both of us had a purpose. Had Allison known to put the plug in, then it would have worked out fine. And, and Or had I shown her how to just drive the boat, how to start it, how to move it forward. But none of that was done by me. I just assumed, and we walk into relationships this way. We just assume they know. And what happens is through that assumption, things fall many times out of order. Problem number two, the covering. When Adam should have stepped up, I want you to know he backed up. He took a bite and things broke down from there. He was supposed to provide a covering. Man's responsibility was to protect and to provide. Genesis 2.22, then the Lord God made woman from the rib he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. Last week when I finished preaching, a lady came up and she said, you know, the Lord revealed something to me as I was reading this scripture that the Lord brought the woman to the man. It's, it's as if when you make a great gift for someone, you don't call them and say, come over and get this great gift I have for you. What do you do? You take that gift to them because you made it specifically for them. That's exactly what happens here. The man said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. He shall, she shall be called woman for she was taken out of man. That is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife and the two become one flesh. See, God's intention was for the man to leave and cleave and the woman to go from covering to covering. Now, how does this happen if, if a woman doesn't have a man? Well, I pray that the woman has a church. We have church fathers. But it's amazing how many of us don't understand simple words that we see yearly, annually happen right in front of us. So if we had a wedding here, we would have a couple that walked down the aisle and I would step forward and I would ask this question, who gives this woman to be married to this man? And the father is supposed to state, her mother and I, I'm not promising I will say that when it's time for my daughters to get married. I haven't decided which side of the line I'm going to be on. But I will say this, why is that question even asked? It's simply asked because there is an order. And the original order, God loved women so much that he wanted them to be cared for. He wanted them to be provided for. He wanted them to be protected. For this reason, a man shall leave. The command is not for the woman to leave. The command is for the man to leave, go establish his own so that he can support a wife, so that he can support one day a family. And this becomes very important because we tend to get this so out of order in our culture today. Well, we're supposed to date in junior high. We're supposed to have a little boyfriend, a little girlfriend. We're supposed to do that. No, you're not. Let me just stop that right now because you might be attracted to them, and that's natural. That's normal. Those are things that happen for sure. But a man is supposed to leave and cleave. And the woman goes from the umbrella of the father to the umbrella of the husband. And she is always protected and cared for through the covering. 
Problem number three, the curse. The woman's curse of is one of being first, of taking charge, if you will. Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, and I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. This is the Lord speaking to the serpent and to the woman. He, the serpent, shall bruise you on the head, and you shall bruise him on the heel. To the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply your pain in childbirth. In pain, you will bring forth children. Yet your desire will be for your husband, and he will rule over you. Now, this is an interesting thing, because I don't have to talk to the women here about the pain of childbirth, or even the enmity between the serpent. Most women, when they see a snake, They go get someone or do something. If nothing else, they scream. And by the way, most of you men do too. Don't act like it's just the woman. See, but here's where I want us to focus. It's this word desire. In the Old Testament, I only know of one other place where it's used. And this word is known as teshukwa. It's the desire. It's it's, that's the that's the Hebrew term for it. And like I said, I just think it's used one other time, maybe two other times in Old Testament Scripture. But this word desire, it's interesting because it encompasses the very things that you're thinking about. It's a sexual desire for the man. It's a desire for children, even knowing the pain involved, a desire for your husband, even though he rules. But most of all, this word means to stretch over, to control, to rule. Now, I started off talking about horses and talking about what's in the DNA, okay? And, and, and I know being married for 25 years, 26 years, I know, I did know that. I'm just trying to be funny. But I know in 26 years that sometimes this, this can bubble up. Now, here's the beautiful thing about knowing that and Allison knowing it and both of us determining that the Bible's going to speak truth for us over what we feel or what we think. Many times she's told me, Curtis, why don't you just pull over and ask? <laughs> and I ask Bill, and because of that, I get nowhere. I'm just kidding. The destination changes. <laughs> Let's keep going. Anyway, um, so this is what happens, right? And, and so she has innately, she, and, and, and it's not that it's bad advice, it's, it's how it's spoken sometimes, right? But the truth is, many times, we have to fight that DNA within us, that old man within us, and we need to recognize, look, what is this? Is it me trying to be in control, or is it me trying to be the helper suitable for him? We look at these things. You know, there's a ton of things that come out of order and create problems that exist in our relationships. A desire to be in charge, a desire for your husband's position, a desire for a man's role. We see this word, like I said, in Genesis used again in chapter 4. The very next generation, you have the story of Cain and Abel, the offspring of Adam and Eve. And, and Cain is so jealous of Abel and his offering before the Lord. And as he burns in this jealousy, what's beautiful about the story is God is speaking directly to Cain. And he tells Cain something. He, he, he says, Cain, sin is crouching at your door and its desire is for you. That word desire is teshukwa again. And what that means, or teshuka again, and what it means is simply like a lion behind a door. When you walk into to the room, he jumps out and overtakes, stretches himself over you. His desire is for you. This is that same curse, and we have to see that, recognize it. There's no doubt, women, just as I spoke last week about what is in the man's Adamic DNA, so this is in yours. Problem number five, the manipulation. The fruit of the tree was good for food, pleasing to the eye. She was listening to a serpent who was manipulating her. Surely if you eat of this, you'll be like God, knowing both good and evil. And from that manipulation, she manipulates, if you will, her husband. She took some and ate. She gave also to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. She was willing to share, but I don't mean to make assumptions here. Eve had something that Adam wanted. Men, 
Most women have something that you want. There is a forbidden fruit. The church doesn't speak about it often, and it's not just her care and her lovely looks and her kindness, but there is no doubt that we have a sexual desire for a woman. And after marriage, it can be used to manipulate A forbidden fruit can be used to manipulate a man for the wrong causes, for the wrong sake. What each has should bring us together out of love, not out of manipulation. Oh, I have so many men who come to me in frustration because the woman has so many conditions before the man can pursue her in that way. It ought not to be so. The the Bible makes it clear that the war of genders is sin. So what happens is we get frustrated one with another. I don't get what I want. She doesn't get what she wants. We've talked about love and respect here many times. We've talked about the crazy cycle. We've talked about the energizing cycle, all of those things. But I want you to know that when we withhold one from the other, it's called manipulation. Eve didn't withhold. She gave him the forbidden fruit so he too could know good and evil, so that he could too possibly be like God. But they were manipulated. And manipulation, there's no doubt, can run through our relationships for the wrong reasons. I don't know of a right one. I heard Dr. Tony Evans say something like this um, some years ago, and I, or maybe months ago, and I wrote it down, and it was on a note card on my desk, and it just seemed to fit. He said, women are out of order, men are out of order, politicians are out of order, Republicans are out of order, Democrats are out of order, churches are out of order, and then we all come together and we say, let's pray. Let's get get God's blessing on this way of disorder. Look, as if God will answer prayer when we choose to be out of order. For healthy families to survive and thrive, we need his order in our lives. Things from the garden on became out of order. Let's talk about God's order. God has an order because he is the God of order. The more we can recognize his order or the enemy's schemes of disorder, the better we can bring his kingdom to earth as it is in heaven. So I've got just a couple of points here, three points to talk about how we apply this. How do we bring things back into order? The first thing I would say is be aware. Be aware. Learn to keep things in the order of God. There have been many times I've, I've, I've recognized in myself that I addressed something in my relationships wrong. I went about it wrong. I said the wrong thing or I spoke emotionally before I paused, pondered, and prayed over that situation. Now, don't look at me the way you're looking at me. You've done it too. Come on now. It's, it's, it's in all of us, right? And we have to be careful. This is why we pause, ponder, and pray. But we need to be aware. We need to be aware of the old man, of what's in our DNA innately. One of our axioms here at Connection is this. Awareness is the first step to responsibility. If my child, when they're small, and they're three years old, when they were three years old, if they went in and just kicked over the trash can, some of our first response would simply be to yank them up and, and to correct them harshly. But should they be responsible for what they weren't aware they shouldn't do? So what do we do? We teach them, you don't do that. You don't do that. You don't do those things. Awareness is the first step of responsibility. And here's what happens is we hold people responsible for what they're not even aware they're doing. We hold a culture out here responsible because they're not even aware, and yet they're not even aware of what they're doing. A culture who who is ravaging the things of God has the world so out of order, uh, politicians to to, um, even churches where things are so out of order and so disorderly and we're trying to hold them accountable to God's word. Awareness is the first step to responsibility. We have a job to do, church, to show a different way, to show God's way, to help them become aware of what's taking place in them. 
I would have loved to have stepped in here and talked about the biological and physiological differences between men and women, to talk about how the brains actually function differently, how, how one sex is more right brain and the other one more left brain and those types of things. But look, we can't even get the biblical things right. How we were made and who created us. Awareness is always the first step to responsibility. Be aware of the old man. Be aware, women, of, oh, golly, I, I have this thing in me that wants to take control, that wants to lead, that wants the position of a man. Men, be aware of your passivity. Romans 6, 6, for we know that, not, that, that our old man or our old self was crucified with him so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin because anyone who has died has been set free from sin in Christ. Men, to know that in Adam and through the sin thereof we neglect our roles such as it starts with me, I'm first, don't neglect our responsibility of cultivating and keeping, protecting, providing, and leading. Men, when we neglect those things, then it just makes sense that the women would step up. I come out of a domination where 77% of leadership and attendees are women. Where are the men? And for women, a predisposition to lead, to stretch over, to manipulate, to tolerate. It's not okay. Second thing I would say as far as applying this is gender equality. God loves both of the genders he's created. Not one more than the other. And if he does, I would have to lean more towards the women for I have my own reasons for that. One, the man's called to protect and provide for her, not her for him but I could go on and on. He doesn't love men over women nor women over men. Galatians 3.28, there is neither Jew nor Greek, neither slave nor free man, neither male nor female, for all of you are one in Christ Jesus. So a man who thinks to rule over his wife means to abuse her, you are wrong. God knows you are wrong, and it is not okay. And women, if you are in that relationship, you need to get out. It's not okay to take abuse after abuse, and I'm talking physical abuse, but if it's even um, to the point where he's calling you names, I can say this honestly. I may have thought them. I've never said them aloud. I've never called Allison a name in 26 years of marriage. Don't hand clap. That's because God told me I couldn't. And he scared me when he said it. And it was just through reading his word. Look, it doesn't make me better, and I don't pat myself on the back. I've thought plenty of things. I've said plenty of things out of anger, but not name-calling. You see, because we have to hold one another in a valuable way. So a man who thinks to rule over his wife means some form of abuse. God will not tolerate it, nor should you tolerate it. In Genesis chapter 1, the scripture says God created both genders and his command was to rule over the earth and subdue it. As a matter of fact, in Genesis chapter 1, it's a little bit different from Genesis chapter 2. In chapter 1, you'll see where male and female were both called to rule over the earth, to subdue it. God is looking for both men and women to unlock the potential of the earth. That's the power that he's created us with. It takes both to unlock the potential of God's kingdom here on this earth, and we are to subdue it. We do this through marriage, yes, but we also do this through the church. The church is called to bring his kingdom, a place for all of us to come and be a part of the family of God, which brings me to my final point this morning, the church. Men and women have roles in life. Men and women have roles in marriage. Men and women have roles in the church. The biblical church that teaches these roles and responsibilities in life is the church that is making itself prepared for its groom one day. What the devil wants to do is to shift the roles or bring conflict within the roles and bring disorder. When Paul writes to Timothy, he says some things that are tough. Now, I'm going to read a scripture to you, and women, you're going to go, oh, my goodness, I already broke it this morning. 1 Timothy 2.11, a woman must quietly receive instruction with entire submissiveness, but I do not allow a woman to teach or exercise authority over a man 
but to remain quiet, for it was Adam who was first created and then Eve, and it was not Adam who was deceived, but the woman being deceived fell into transgression. A woman must quietly receive. And then he says um, she's not to exercise authority over a man to remain quiet. Have you spoken this morning? Are you living according to the word of God? The apostle Paul writes to Timothy. Timothy is a young pastor. Timothy is having to figure out what it means for women to be involved in what they knew previously as a synagogue and not a church. Jesus opened it up and invited both male and female that, that even though there, there, there are things going on in Timothy's day and time and being a young pastor, you remember even Paul tells Timothy, he says, don't let anyone look, look down upon your youth. What's he talking about? Can women speak? Well, he's setting an order here because it felt disorderly to everyone with a woman speaking and what they knew previously as a synagogue, but today is the church. The synagogues and churches are not the same thing. The synagogue was set up for the Jews. But I don't, did Paul stay in that place? Well, Paul tells the church of Corinth, he, he, they have a problem at the church of Corinth. And Paul tells them, he, he says, hey, men, let me tell you what the problem is. You guys are coming and, and drinking all the communion juice. And you're eating all the communion bread, and we want to have church, and there's nothing there. And some of you even got drunk on it. That's bad. And in the same time, he talks to these women and he says, you need, to, you, you, you need to have long hair. You don't need to adorn yourself with all this stuff. And what's he do, doing? He's setting a precedence for them. Does that mean that they can't teach? They can't speak? Paul is correcting in his letters. There is no doubt. He's trying to bring God's order in it. But I want you to see, see something. Peter, when he preaches his first message, in Acts chapter 2, he quotes Joel and he says, It shall be in the last days, God says, that I will pour forth my, of my spirit on all mankind and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy and your young men shall see visions and your old men shall dream dreams. Even on my bond slaves, both men and women, I will in those days pour forth my spirit and they shall prophesy. To prophesy is to proclaim. The apostle Paul in Romans chapter 16, the very one that cautions Timothy about women speaking at that time and the very one that talks about women and head covering and men and what they should do and their covering is from God and their covering should be over women, women and all of those processes that bring order. An interesting thing in Romans 16, he says, I commend to you our sister Phoebe, a deacon of the church in Sincheri, I ask you to receive her in the Lord in a way worthy, worthy of his people and to give her any help she may need from you for she has been the benefactor of many people, including me. Phoebe is a prophetess where? In a church. And who has been the benefactor? Paul. People are, are getting ministered to. Well, she's a prophetess. She is proclaiming. The word itself means to proclaim. To proclaim with authority. And it's interesting, she's a deacon. Some of our churches are set up in such a way where a deacon is an actual office within the church. So then brings up the question, is there ordination? What is happening here? We have churches that are built upon this passage of Scripture and this passage of Scripture and try to enforce and leave others out when they don't see the whole Scriptures of what's taking place. First, who was it written to? Second, what does it say? Third, what does it say to us today? So the Apostle Paul, he tells one, to, he tells one man to tell his women to stop speaking, and on the other hand, he turns around and commends Phoebe for hers. You see, there are offices within the church and there are spiritual gifts within the church. And listen, spiritual gifts are not limited to gender. I'm reading a book right now. That is, uh, I won't tell you the name of the book, but it's written by a woman. Oh my gosh, Curtis, no, you didn't say that. Yeah, I did. And it's written on Arminian, Arminianism versus Calvinism. Not everyone would want to read that book. 
But I have read several, and this is the best, most well-written book on that subject that I've read. Do they have something to say? Yes, she's gifted. Does she have a gift of understanding, a gift of discernment? Most definitely she does. The Apostle Paul tells the church in Corinth, um, look, that, in, that we are a body, and though one, the body has many parts, but all of its parts form one body, so it is with Christ. For we were all baptized into one spirit and to form one body, whether Jew or Gentile, slave or free. We were all given one spirit to drink, male or female. Even so, the body is not made up of one part, but of many. And that includes women and their gifts. You see, we use our gifts. We celebrate our gifts together for the building up in the service for his kingdom purpose. Our gifts are subject to Christ and his church. Now, I will say this. The women ministers do not hold offices such as senior pastor, eldership, bishop, but these are reserved to men in the church to oversee and to keep the order of God. Those We have an elder team here. And it will always consist of men only. We have a senior pastor position here that will only consist of a man. Why? To demonstrate there must be order so that that order can go on. And be, be shown, can be shown in the homes as well. Because there is no doubt that when things get out of order, there becomes a problem. The husband governs the home and the church Watch this, with recognition of equality. My girls get on to Allison all the time because she loves Wade more than them. That's my son. It's a joke in our house. It's not true. We, we love them all. And then Wade would probably accuse me of loving my girls because I'm so protective, overly protective of my girls than him. Wade will call me, hey, Dad, what do you think? Da -da 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 -da. I don't know. You'd be all right. Just engage and go on, son. Right? Grow up and be a man. That's pull, your, pull yourself up by your bootstrap. I wouldn't tell my girls that. Allison was talking about one of them getting an apartment. I was like, oh, absolutely not. Uh-uh. See, there's an order, and it should be a, a good order. It should be a church order. And, and look, in giftings, there is no doubt Little Eloise can come up here and preach this roof off this place. She'll do it. I can hand her the mic right now. I got no problem with it. But she will still say she's under the authority of her husband and under the authority of the eldership. Men, love your wives as Christ loved the church. Set the example. Look, it's disappointing and it can be frustrating when it's not going the way you want it to go. It can be that way even in the church, and church fathers learn to love and what it means to nourish our widows, what it means to nourish those women among us who, who are, are not yet married or have been married and no longer married. Men, we have a great call because ultimately the Scripture tells us we're the ones that will be held accountable for their souls. So just as men are under God, and if you will, women under men, both are under God, and that's exactly what the Apostle Paul says in Ephesians chapter 5. We all know Ephesians 5.21, but very few can quote Ephesians 5.19, where it says, therefore submit to one another as unto the Lord. We know 5.21, wives submit to your husbands. You see how we mix it up and how we build doctrine just on one thing? Be careful with that. I want to encourage all of us. I had a, a young woman years ago who I had uh, noticed at camp, and she would stay afterwards, and she would stay in worship. And while she was worshiping, um, I could just see there's an anointing on this young woman. Her name's Taylor. And she was trying to figure some things out in life. And, and one day after, after worship that night, I walked up, and I said, Listen, Taylor, uh, God has shown me specifically you're to do this, this, and this. And she started crying. And, and she was, she was kind of conflicted because she knew the tradition that said she couldn't. And what was a beautiful testimony is where Taylor has gone 
in this life and how many she has led to Jesus Christ, not through the office that she ever held, but through the spiritual gift that was working and ministering through her. One gender is not above the other. There's just simply order. Someone puts the plug in, someone drives the ship. That's how it ought to be. Church, if you'd please stand. I'm going to ask if the altar team would make their way forward. We have a lot to pray over. I'll ask you to remember my dad. I just got a phone call that uh, they're taking him by ambulance. He's having some heart troubles, so please remember him. But we have so many. Uh, Gen Z Oder overseas and feeding and helping um, a country that I don't want to speak of that's war-torn right now. And please remember him and remember Rachel and pray over them. I know they covet our prayers this morning. And I want to pray for you because we didn't choose our genders. There's only two. But I want you to hear me, church. One is not above the other. We learn in what completes the body of Christ is all of us using our gifts. You know, I don't really care much about titles. We use our gifts in order to embrace, to encourage, to equip, and empower others for their gift sets and for their ministry. And that's who we're called to be and become. If you would like prayer this morning, I'm going to encourage you to come forward. Father God, I thank you for each one here this morning. I thank you, Father, for who you created us to be as an example of the body of Christ as an example of the bride of Christ and what we, what we can look like to be ironing one another out without spot or wrinkle, to be washing one another in your word, to be growing up and le learning what it means to live in relationship with you, what it means to live in relationship with ourselves and live in relationship one with another. And then you take it further and you call us beyond our borders. You call us to love our neighbor as ourselves to show them, to teach them, to encourage them and bring your order into their lives. Father, we thank you that you are a God of order and not of disorder. I thank you that as we are born again, if there's someone here that doesn't know you and wants to be born again, have them come forward, Lord. Let them know that it's you tugging on their spirit to be born again so that the old man can be put away and behold, the new has come, that the DNA has changed and they are no longer in the Adamic sin nature but they are born again to be, to be set free in you. And that's their DNA. And that DNA breaks generational curses. That DNA, Lord, is the DNA that brings your kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. It's that DNA, God, that transforms us into your image. And it's that DNA, Lord, that, that runs through and transforms and calls a world back to order because it calls the world back to you. In Jesus' name, amen.